from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report, where we count down the top 10 things of the week that made us go wow. wow. I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder, joined by our Chief Creative Officer, Tom Campbell. Hello, hello, hello. Yo. And literary sensation editor of the WOW Report, James St. James. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm queer, and I'm ready to go. All right, let's get into the countdown. Number 10, Tom. Number 10. I'm fine. I'm in a bit of a, of a depression. Are a you? little gloom. I, I rarely go there. I can usually bounce back. And part of it was prepping for this show. And I don't say that, but there's nothing. There's just a lot of crap going on. Can I just say though, bless you for sharing that. Because, you know, we spend so much time pretending everything's fine and we're just busy and happy, you know? And I oftentimes am shallow and delusional and I do think everything's going fine and I am happy. And there's just something about what's happening in pop culture. I don't want to break it all down, but number 10, is is perfect case because it's 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 do we need you know it's, it's we need to talk about blank do we need to talk about Kanye West? I don't oh. want to tear him down because he well, can. No, be I down. think he's perfectly fine to tear him down. What he did was reprehensible. Let's tear him down. A absolutely, but like, is it someone who has mental health issues? Probably. Who also, you know, it's. Okay, well, here's the thing, and this is this is what people have been saying online that I tend to Thank agree you. with, is that you can have mental health health issues, and you can also be anti-Semitic, and the two things can exist at the same time, and one is not the cause of the other. He's not anti-Semitic because he has health, mental health issues. The thing he said was anti-Semitic and disgusting and horrible, and it's it's it exists on a separate plane other than whatever issues he's having. And I want to be very clear. I in no way condone. He he said some horrible anti-Semitic things, which I'm not going to give air to. But you know, and he was taken off Twitter, and people, even Fox News, irony of ironies, which was supporting him one day when the anti-Semitic stuff came out, sort of like repositioned their their love for him. But did you but, watch I, the Tucker Carlson interview? First of all, I, I can't bring Ugh. myself to. It's but so I, weird because Tucker Carlson, who is, um, uh, you know, race baiting all the time, and he's always, you know, he's on this whole white replacement theory or whatever they call it. Yeah. Then he has, um, he has Kanye on, and they go into all this sort of racist stuff, but it never, there's never any like, like Kanye is fine for Tucker because Kanye is spouting the right wing uh, conspiracy theories that Tucker is, is, but at any other point, it's just the whole thing made no sense. Whatsoever. Right. It's just utter confusion. It's utter chaos. It's th there's mm -hmm. no sort of handle or grip on reality in any of this by saying his name. Do I just add the small bit of air I have, but do I add air, air to the fire, oxygen to the fire? Like, what do you do with no, all but that? You need, I, to you need to denounce this shit when it happens or else you, you are giving it air by not denouncing it. See, you, uh, yes. And, and it isn't as if this latest outrage is completely disconnected from previous outrage, it doesn't come out of the blue, like right. the white life, white lives matters T-shirt thing. Yes, and then it's also it's, that it's, it's, the yeah, Adidas uh, ripping off my designs insanity, and before that the Gap insanity, and before and, that and the way the, he's been treating Kim in in uh, yeah, you know all in um, the bullying and the harassment. Pete, yeah, Pete Davidson, the bullying, the harassment. All of it is is connected. All of which I see comes from a delusional belief that you are some kind of savior or messianic figure, which feels also like, like a how come that psychotic would break right indulged, right? And in the whole Trump, you know, when he in the very a couple of years ago when he when Trump first got into office and he was wearing the MAGA hats and visiting Trump and and he seems to. You're right. He he has a messianic complex that had, nobody has ever bothered to try and deal with. And it go and you go back to uh, the Beyonce Taylor Swift VMAs 20, 15 years ago. Like yeah. this has been building and building and building, and he just keeps getting away with it in a way that is so Trumpian 
2022, yes. everybody's getting well, away and by the everything. way, let's be clear. I, I think Trump has mental issues, too, that also we have similarly failed to really address. And that for whatever reason, the culture has almost fostered. embraced. But it's not like canceling him. It's not like censoring him. But when do you stop paying attention to the person with the mental issues who has a you know this messiah complex? I, I don't know. It feels like if it were a friend of mine, I would cut them off. I you know what I'm saying if it were somebody in my sphere, I would distance myself and protect myself. Um, hmm. But I you know in in is it as simple as getting Kanye? onto whatever meds he needs and then he can go but he can be the person i think their issues are never simple you know that's the problem exactly that, there know. lies a huge problem because when it comes I, I think we've all experienced this in our own lives personally when someone is unwell and dealing with issues only they can seek out the medical help they need you cannot force them or yeah. Yeah. um and it's such a sort of dilemma because it's a sad, sad situation. It's a rock and a hard place. Listen, we're not going to figure it out in this time sure. frame. And I, like I said, I wanted to ignore it, but it's like it's everywhere and it's on my mind. And so for this brief moment, we've, you know, connected and, and uh, gotten through this. So uh, to be continued, sadly, Kanye. And I thought you were going to talk about Happy Meals for Adults, Tom. <laughs> I was, but I went out this morning. Maybe this is why I'm depressed. They're all sold out. I went from McDonald's to McDonald's to McDonald's, and they're all sold out. So I said, another... that, I'm going to just, it was the beginning of a depression. I was expecting McNuggets, and I got nothing. This may be another symptom of a sick society that we're infantilizing adults with Happy Meals. Is that what we really need? The other footnote in this is I went, I, I didn't go to the drive-thru. I went in the McDonald's in Hollywood and West Hollywood, and three of them. And Three the of population, them. the people inside the McDonald's, it really is probably what got me sad because it's people with mental illness and um, just yelling and screaming and dirty and it, it, not everyone, but it's like, it's just, I don't know, the, the, the fabric of the world seems very fragile right now. I know I'll, I'll get my spirit on the right side and the sunny side soon, but it's just, there's a lot going on. Oof. I hate to be that way. Number eight. No. no, how do you do this? All that you just skip over me. Time. You got one job, Fenton. This one job. Right. No, you do this. One and talk job about to down from ten delicate, to fragile one. mental health, and I get just I I cry afterwards because I'm just I'm just shunted to the side every damn episode. You cannot erase James St. James. No, I will not be canceled by you. James, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Number eight, I love no! you. Number, Number nine. nine. Oh, good gosh. You see, you're giving me a complex. I'm being given a complex about counting. I'm giving everyone's, a a numerical... as as everyone's a victim here. I'm good. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> now you're going to say my time is up. It's ready for number eight. <laughs> Number nine with extra time. <laughs> Take it from me. Number nine. After 40 some years, I have finally watched trilogy of terror okay i had never seen this before it's the 1975 made for tv movie from abc and it was the movie that terrified generations of kids of generations of children's tom i would have thought that you were one of them you're giving me a blank look like you it, re it rings a bell but you need to fill me in okay well first of all the 70s were a banner period for tv horror movies on abc there was burnt offerings there was bad ronald there was don't be afraid of the dark there was the dark secret of harvest home there were all these just really scary 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 movies and this was the scariest one of them all it's three different stories each of them starring cult icon karen black okay now um, the first two are pretty forgettable the first one is it's like a date rape story gone wrong terribly wrong for the rapist Okay. The second one, Karen Black plays two sisters. One is very mousy and one is very brassy and, and like a whore. And that one is sort of predictable. You see where that one's going pretty quickly. Now, the there. third one, though, this is the one that everybody remembers. This was on Sven Gulli, and Sven Gulli was talking about it. Sven Gulli's on Me Too. He's like an Elvira and he shows old horror movies and, 
and then their puppets and he tell you know blah, blah. but he kept saying over and over again that's coming up if you're if you're easily triggered if you're scared easily if you have little ones in the room if you have heart medication you might want and i kept thinking could this really a 1975 movie really be that scary because everyone's talked about it all my life so there's this african devil doll that that um karen black gets and the, there's a, a comes with a scroll and it says that if the if the necklace breaks he'll come to life and later if she walks in the room and there's the necklace lying on the floor and he's he's run away and this we've all seen scary dolls with chucky and annabelle or whatever but this was the first scary doll movie okay and it's so low tech and it is so crazy but there's this little ah, 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 and he's running around he's got these sharp teeth and he's like hiding under the couch and he grabs onto her and she's like got this doll on her arm that she's swinging around and you think it but it really is very 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 scary and i was like literally like jumping out of my skin it builds so quickly and though it's like 20 minutes of just sheer terror with this little doll chasing chasing around biting her biting her biting she's bloody everything she's running through the apartment all bloody but i would love to have a 20 something watch this movie I think it's probably on YouTube, but just watch it and come back and tell me if it's as scary as I think it is, because it might be just year decades of me hearing about how scary it is. So I'm fed into it, but it trilogy of terror. The great thing about horror for me is sometimes the cheaper it's done, the yes. scarier it, it becomes when watching it. Yes. And there's just something about the building of the terror in this from the the first two stories aren't that scary. And so you're sort of let your guard down. And then all of a sudden this doll just, oh, my God, trilogy of terror, Karen Black, 1975. Try and find it and tr- get back to me about it. I want to watch it, it, and it sounds. I want to ex- uh, uh, explore it as a possible RuPaul's Drag Race challenge. It sounds. Oh like, like yes. <laughs> well, it's streaming on Prime Video. So there you go. Number eight. Number eight. I think I was so excited to get to number eight, not to skip James St. James, but no, because no. after three years of waiting. The tickets for uh, Pet Shop Boys and New Order performing live at the ball finally came to fruition after many a pandemic cancellation and postponement. What can I say? I mean, I've always loved the Pet Shop Boys, yes, and they were really good. I mean, they were just really good, and they just cantered through the many greatest hits of which I, you know I've I, seen them a number of times and they put on quite a show they are so good and every single song is so fantastic and even though they're like about have a collective age of about 200 years old they're still you know they're still like boys and Neil Lowe is it Neil Lowe Chris Neil. Lowe Chris Lowe never cracks a smile completely impassive never as much as taps his toe just behind the synthesizer in a, in a variety of caps and sunglasses. And- you know, what's interesting about that, though, is that I had dinner with them uh, a few years ago. You had dinner with them? Yes. Because they were they were huge disco, they're huge party monster fans. They're huge, huge, huge. And they asked David Keeps to arrange a dinner. And I went, and interestingly, Chris was the one who never, he was blah, 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 going a mile a minute and just cracking jokes and absolutely hysterical. And Neil was the one who was sort of quiet and reserved. They've switched personas on stage they do stage. right i mean it's not that neil's that outgoing now does does chris have a very posh voice like neil um no it's it's more of a, i want to say cockney because everyone to me is if you're british you're either posh or you're cockney but he um he's he's got that sort of like um west end boy uh west end boy yeah west end, west end rent boy maybe yes yes <laughs> He's Listen, very sexy. Though, He's still um, there. He is sexy. sexy. He's always been sexy. Um, yeah. You never told me you had a dinner with the Pet Shop Boys because they love Party Monster. I feel I'm feeling this is a bit of a reveal. Oh well, the thing the thing about it was is they were actually very disappointed in me. <laughs> they thought I was going to be like a, a, a laugh a minute, and I guess I wasn't because we've never had dinner again. <laughs> they yeah. pepper you with questions. They did. They had a million questions, and um, they were, uh, like I said, they were they were an absolute delight. They were it was a lot of fun. All right, I'm going to get nothing out of this. Okay, so New Order also played after the Petrol Boys. I have to say, New Order, were it not for Blue Monday, 
If it weren't for a drum machine, I don't think we'd have paid any attention to New Order. I mean, really? that is the uh hit of the drum machine. And the thing about them is that, as you probably know, New Order emerged out of Joy Division. The lead singer, I believe, killed himself. Um, and they went on to have, you know, huge pop hits with Blue I mean, one of the most best-selling singles of its time. Wait, are they Bizarre Love Triangle too? Yeah, they did Bizarre Love Triangle. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they have a few. Not as many as the Pet Shop Boys. And Ceremony? And, yeah, okay, they have three. Three <laughs> hits. <laughs> but here's my point. They seem to be trying to get back to their Joy Division roots. And I'm sorry, if you do Blue Monday without a drum machine, just stay at home. I mean, it just didn't sound good. And they kind of showed up in t-shirts and it all sounded indie rock and it did not sound like the records. It did not sound like synthesizers and drum machines locked in sync. Going Fenton, at our age, we deserve songs that sound like the originals. Am I right? We pay all that money. I, I'm not very good. At, if it doesn't sound like the record, I'm out of that. I hear you. <laughs> wait, wait. I guess the question, though, is did no one appreciate it? Did no one like it? I thought Nolan, I mean, I think was somewhat there under sufferance of like, you know, his dad saying, you need to watch this. But going in, I was saying, well, every gay in the village is going to be here. And Billy was like, no. Every old white man is going to be here. <laughs> I love Billy. Billy <laughs> Billy calls it like he sees it. Well, we were both right. It was every old white man who is gay was a Hollywood soul. I had some no. FOMO. I looked online. I felt like I was the only old white gay not there. So you I'm were. glad you went. You were. Exactly. Um, it was very cute. It was called the Unity Tour. But I just can't imagine as acts they have much in common and they can't see them having a kiki backstage or braiding each well, other. Well, wait, hair. you know, one time I was backstage at uh the Radio City Music Hall with when Pet Boys Shop played. This was in the late 80s. Oh, again, just hang out with the Pet Shop Boys all the time. I was, I was. But um, it was funny because I was there with Larry T. We'll have to talk about this tomorrow because Larry and I are sitting on a um a sofa and all of a sudden Liza Minnelli runs in and she's like, darling, darling, oh my God, it's so good to see you both. And she ran over and kissed us and just plopped down and started chatting. She had no idea who we were. She, she thought she you were the Pet Shop makeup, Boys. Full outfit, full makeup. And then she, after chatting with us, she said, oh, I've got to go. And she ran up on stage and did Losing My Mind. Losing oh, My Mind. Oh, that was a high point of the show, Losing My Mind. I mean, how it's so good. It's so it's, good. It's one of my favorite songs. That and Being Normal. Being Normal is just, mm -hmm. that it makes me cry every time. Oh, Suburbia. They did Suburbia. suburbia. Of course they oh, did it. It's yes. a sin. They did It's a Sin. You know. It was just one of those shows. They should do a sing-along Pet Shop Boys concert, you know, because all the old queens know all the words, you know. All right, that'll be available at the World of Wonder uh, Retirement Home. Sing-along Pet Shop Boys, <laughs> <That's> right? <laughs> uh, Pet Shop Boys and New Order wrap up their joint tour this Sunday in Vancouver. Hmm. RuPaul's Drag Race Live just finished its 300th show at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. History has been made. Snatch your tickets to see the phenomena for yourself. Ticketmaster.com slash Drag Race Vegas. Yeah. I've got a question. I love it. Well, um, we'll be back from our break in a jiffy. And the jiffy is an actual unit of time. How long is it? What? <laughs> All right, we'll be right back after the break. We'll be back in a jiffy with the answer. This is Wild Report on Radio Andy, Sirius XM. You're listening to World of Wonders, Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. It's Fenton here with James and Tom and Blake. We're counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow. But first, of course, Blake has the answer to a teasing question. Yeah, um, a jiffy is an actual unit of time. I learned that this week. How long is a jiffy? I don't know the actual answer, but I do know there was a brand of condoms in Britain called Jiffies, and the whole slogan was, come in a jiffy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, of course, am thinking of Jiff peanut butter and wondering, is this plain or nutty? <laughs> I wonder if this is actually pronounced giffy. Um, <laughs> nice, but, nice. Uh, 
but Jiffy, I'm who even what what culture had something called a Jiffy? Is this like Arabic or something? It sounds it? spacey to me. It sounds space agey. I, I think would say a Jiffy is um, uh, uh, 14 light years. One one hundredth of a second is a Jiffy. Oh, I'll be ding dong. One one hundredth. So if you came in a Jiffy, that's like really yeah. fast. So yeah. using it in a sentence, it would be like James St. James attention span is a jiffy. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> James is not having <laughs> any of that. Attention. He doesn't even know he's been insulted. We're fine. <laughs> <laughs> we are counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow. We've reached number seven. Number seven. Space, a new frontier. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Um, there's an excerpt from a new book that William Shatner has written. I'm going to read quite a bit, so bear with me. But it, it's a, it was exclusive to Variety. Of course, when he was 90 years old last year, last October, he, Jeff Bezos took him into outer space on one of those space tours, right? Well, I remember you know, well. Time, it, it was, you know, you know and, and, and kind of what great, what great marketing that was for Jeff Bezos. Well, this, these are two paragraphs that I have to read and then we're going to discuss and bear with me. Um, Captain Kirk, William Shatner wrote this. I had thought that going to space would be the ultimate catharsis of that connection I'd been looking for between all living things. That being there would be the next beautiful step to understanding the harmony of the universe. In the film Contact, Contact with Jodie Foster, characters go, the character goes to space and looks out into the heavens and she lets out an astonished whisper, they should have sent a poet. I had a different experience, says Shatner, because I, discover, I discovered that the beauty isn't out there it's down here with all of us living behind live, leaving that behind made my connection to our tiny planet even more profound i'm almost done it was among the strongest feelings of grief i have ever encountered the contrast between the vicious coldness of space and the warm nurturing of earth below filled me with an overwhelming sadness Every day we are confronted with the knowledge of our further destruction of Earth at our hands, the extinction of animals, species, of flora and fauna, things that took five billion years to evolve, and suddenly we will never see them again because of the interference of mankind. It filled me with dread. My trip to space was supposed to be a celebration. Instead, it felt like a funeral. Okay, another reason I'm, I'm depressed this week, but... I, I, I do wonder, listen, we're always given the, you know, the space program creates all of this technology and things that we know uh, that help us here back on earth. But that quest to leave this planet, to spend money, to go, to dream that there's salvation out there and there's so much science fiction about that. We are destroying our planet. We're running out of water. What do you think of what William Shatner had to say? Uh, okay, two things here. Number one is that I've heard from many, 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 many uh, astronauts over the years that I have that I have dinner with all the time. I'm always having dinners with astronauts, and they're always telling me, James. They say that there is a very profound sadness that comes yeah. when you look out onto the onto the planet, and you think that it's going to be this joyful feeling, but there's actually a, a feeling of profound sadness that comes with it. And just seeing the infinite, the vastness of space, and understanding you are placed in it and everything like that that there's there's a a, a, a feeling that you, you you don't quite expect that's going to happen so that is what happened to him um but the other thing is um i don't think tom i i think we can walk and chew gum at the same time and i think that you can deal with the problems on the planet but you can also reach out into space and see that eventually at some point we are going to have to terraform other planets we are going to have to leave the planet but we can still save the planet while we're here you know i mean like we can do both of them at the same time i don't think there's any reason not to I've, I've always program. been fascinated by the space program and i want to believe what you say is true and i'm having a bad day but i don't know if that's true anymore it's like for some reason launching missiles into space which are just like big kind of like uh, uh, penis enhancers yes. doesn't have the same excitement as ridding the oceans of plastic. No, 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 no. You're absolutely true. Ocean as water. long as it be, is a, a play thing for billionaires like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and everybody, yes. that it will have an icky feeling attached to it. But the idea of NASA actually going to Mars and actually discovering things on other planets and discovering if there's water, if there's life, if there's, you know, on the moons of, 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 Saturn or what you know or of Jupiter that there's all these supposed like you know 
amazing things out there. That's that's still beautiful and fantastic and wonderful, and we should be doing. You're it. absolutely right, and discovery and knowledge. But I just and 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 um, earlier in the in the book, William does uh, Shatner does talk about that same syndrome you're talking about the astronauts have, and it's yeah. not unusual. But but I just thought that perspective because I was a little skeptical of William Shatner when he did. I thought, oh, he's 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 adding to the propaganda of this whole thing. But he had this profound feeling that just he felt. And they say when they look down on Earth, astronauts say too, it's like you don't see borders. You don't see yeah. a difference. You see this one living, beautiful organism. And, you know, again, it's it's too much for this show or for us to ever figure out. But I, I was fascinated by Williams. I do uh, think uh, it was a telling moment when he landed and was trying to speak right after that. And Jeff Bezos sort of walks up and just sprays him with champagne and sort of interrupts him. You were just like, oh, my gosh, you know. Yeah, and he, he talks about how the difference between Jeff Bezos drinking champagne and got, and whooping it up, and he had to sort of he was sort of in tears and yeah. mourning the, the yeah. dichotomy of the, those two right. separate things. Is I very, also have great respect for ninety year old people who are having that kind of experience. You know, like just the life he's been through and the cycle of his life, and to look back and have those feelings, it's kind of profound. Well, if anyone deserves to go to space, it's William Shatner. You know, and is he, he deserves ninety years to, old. Yeah. He was ninety when he went. Yep. Wow. And you know, I mean, Jeff Bezos does not need. I, you know, that disgusts me and makes me feel gross. But whatever. Let's move on to number six, James. It's all about you. Number six. So I read a book, I Scream, by Tama Janowitz. Um, it's the, her twenty sixteen autobiography. It's billed as a memoir of dysfunction and glamour. And if you uh, remember Tama Janowitz, which I'm sure, Fenton, you do, she was the 80s literary it girl who was part of something called the Lit Pack. And it was her and Brett Easton Ellis and Jay McInerney. And they all were sort of lumped together by the press, even though she really didn't have much to do with them. She was more part of the Warhol, Paige Powell interview set. And she... Um, Full disclosure, I've been trying to get Tama to do podcasts, the podcast, the Night Fever podcast, and I've been talking to her, and she keeps saying, I don't want to do it. I don't have anything to say. I don't remember anything. And I keep saying, Tama, no, please. It's, you know, you're know, you going to have fun. It's going to be, I don't, I'm not going to do it, blah, 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 blah. So I said I would read this book. I would read Scream and then get back to her with some questions and see if it would work. Well, having read the book, I can sort of understand where she's coming from because she says, <laughs> you know, listen, no, she says, I live alone on a ranch in New Mexico now. I don't have any connection to anybody. I don't have, it's, it, my life is so different now. I don't have any, you know, I don't need to talk about that anymore. And this book is a story about how in the 80s, she went from it girl and hanging out with Warhol and blah, blah, blah. And then her father, who is a crazed pot addict and her mother, who was a professor and a poet and sort of a very, um, very erudite woman, I guess. And uh, she it needs help. And so she goes to help her mother out and she goes, puts her in a home and she's trying to put the, bring that house back together again. And she, every, she has to leave everything behind and go live in this upstate New York town. And she has to live with all these. It, it just, it's a very sad and depressing story of taking care of her elderly parents and they don't really appreciate it. And the townspeople don't really get her. She doesn't get the townspeople. And then the mother dies just as she's building this house for trying to get her out of the home, blah, blah, blah. It's very sad and it's very depressing. And um, it's, but it's done in Tama's inimitable style. And it's a fascinating, fascinating look. She has a lot of, she has some stories about how Andy Warhol was very cheap and very sort of mean spirited and not generous and how he was so wealthy and he would take her out to dinner and she would have to pay for her half. And like, she, so she would order like a salad and then he'd order like caviar and then make it split it down the middle, split it down, the the middle. middle down the middle. <laughs> and like, so there's like all these stories about that. that and it's weird that everybody has their own Andy Warhol version of themselves and like going shopping with him was very hard because he wouldn't buy her anything. I'd sort of, it's very strange, but she has all these stories about that time and then about her current life. And it's a fascinating, fascinating memoir. And if you get a chance, if you remember Slaves of New York, check out Scream. I sure do. I'm, I'm, I met her a few times. I might've even had lunch with her, James. As a matter yes, of fact. no, she is. She's fascinating and she's funny and she's she very smart. 
And I think if you're listening to this, go to her Facebook page and just bombard her with uh, say, do it, do the podcast, do James St. James podcast. She was on the talk show circuit back then, right? Yes, yes, yes. I remember from that. And I would only say if all she talked about was her book and her life after the nightlife, I think that's fascinating. Oh, it is. It's totally fascinating. And, and she, she has such a handle on, on, you know, going from one to the other that not many people have. I remember her as nothing but warm and funny, actually. Yeah, and that big, way, big, big way, hair. She had the big, big, yes, big, big Louis hair. the Fourteenth hair. She uh-huh. didn't need to be warm or funny and nice, but she was. All right, she only ate salads, as I recall. Only ate salads. <laughs> Number five. Number five. I was like, okay, I gotta have something to talk about. I I want to watch the Lincoln Project on Showtime. I'll watch the first episode. Yeah, and. Five hours later, I finished with the fifth episode. What now, is I it? Have Tell to me say, hmm? What is it? I don't know about this. It is a series, a documentary series about the Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Project was a super PAC. Already it sounds deadly dull, but it isn't. They raised something like $75 million, and their express purpose was to troll Trump. Because oh, they just were Republican. Conway, Kellyanne Conway's husband is a big part of it. He was indeed a big part of it. And here's the interesting thing. George Conway is hardly in this. He is in all five hours, all of twice. And I think he has one soundbite in the entire thing. And therein lies some of my frustration with this series. The other part of the frustration is, even though they're talking about the 2020 election and what have you, it just feels old. It feels so long ago. The other problem is, and you're probably wondering, well, why did I even keep watching, is it's, you know, they're Republicans, the guys who founded this this super PAC, the Lincoln Project, and they don't suffer from a low opinion of themselves. They are so <laughs> fucking self-important, as only Republicans can be, I guess. Are they mostly <laughs> white guys as well? Uh, all totally white. I think there are two African-Americans who appear briefly in the entire thing again. So diversity, in fact, and there's a Latino guy and there's a woman and they both get driven out of it early-ish on in the whole things. But I was strangely compelled um, because, you know, I, I, it's just, it was sort of fascinating how they did what they did and it was amazing and then the sort of the January the 6th comes along. And then they're strangely consumed by infighting. People are like, where did the 75 million go? And one of the original founders paid his consultancy company $27 million. And you're like, what's going on here? And that you never really get the answer. They just say, well, no one ever made generational wealth. And I thought that was an interesting turn of phrase. Like, made money, but not generational wealth, which I guess is some kind of other level of wealth. You, yeah, well, more, than, wealth a more than a jiffy, more than a jiffy, more than a jiffy of wealth. And then the other thing that happened is that one of the original founders was exposed uh, for being a sexual abuser and getting underage boys to come and work on the campaign in return for sexual faith. And it, so the whole, by the fifth hour, this, this organization is sort of imploding. And you're just like, wow. It's it's like, because my I have a point here. I have a point. I do have a point. And I will get that forthwith. The best part of the entire series is actually almost in the first few minutes where you see Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and Lindsey Graham all delivering killer knockout sound bites about what an evil piece of shit Donald Trump is. And then... 30 seconds later, they're like, Trump this, Trump that, yada, yada, the hypocrisy and the vulva. That is one of the best moments of the Kellyanne whole thing. Kellyanne Conway was very famously used to talk shit about Trump. Yes, but... When she was, when she was on the Ted... Right, Ted and, and the absence of Conway, of her husband in this, is really disturbing. But I suppose, and this is my point, like I, I watched to the very end because I felt that this five-hour journey, and it probably didn't need to be five hours, this five-hour journey, at the end of it, the, the Lincoln Project is kind of self-destructed or just sort of, you know, you just think of it and you think of self-seeking people making money out of the whole thing and you think of sex abuse and scandal. Like, it's it sort of, the whole series basically 
it doesn't destroy it. They destroy themselves. But but then Trump got away with it. All of it. It's it's this sort of bizarre magic thing by which this amazing organization set up really went after Trump. And in this five hour behind the scenes, they just sort of well, did, fall into but a did, hole did they of their own making. And I just and as and people are just all being righteous about the corruption of the organization and this and that. And then you're thinking, hang on a second, the person that they were out to take down is still going strong, untouched, unscathed. But but and, but Fenton is is it be are, did they implode because they failed at their job and therefore they they had nowhere else to go but to implode or you know because I remember very very specifically that every time a, a new one dropped a new video dropped we would immediately post it on the Wow Report we I mean we would laugh they were so good they were, they were so good and now we need them probably more than ever and they aren't there for us. Yeah, I mean, all I, there I is now is that. this Showtime sort of takedown job by um, Fisher Stevens and Kareem Armour. I mean, it's it's so weird the way we can't. I I don't know. I mean, I watched the whole thing, so and why I watched it, I can't really tell you. And I feel that the outcome is I, I, I'm but, just but sort we, of empathizing with Tom's like mood. That. We sort need of, people who are going to hold these people accountable. We need them. Yeah, we do. We do. Because because uh, it's happening all over again. It yeah. is. It is. It's. But it, and if we don't have to happen, it's not happening all over again. It continues. It the continues. walls are falling down. The mm. dominoes are clicking. Hi, yeah. I'm in a great mood this week. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. No, the Third Reich lives on, and I. I all we it just seems that uh, the. the all we seem to be able to do is shoot ourselves in the foot. Or if we don't shoot ourselves in the foot, one of our own will come up and shoot us. It's the most bizarre thing. I can't explain it. Well, Democrats I mean, will always, what is it, snatch uh, snatch victory from the... Snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah. Or whatever it might be. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. Uh, when we come back, we'll carry on with our countdown of the top 10 things this week that made us go, wow. Blake, do you have a question? Yes. Cats have over 100 vocal sounds, Tom. How many do dogs have? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Listen to Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. Fenton here with James and Tom and Blake with a teasing, perplexing question. Yes, cats have over 100 vocal sounds. How many do dogs have? I would Four. say 300. Can I bring in an expert here? I've got my cat, Einstein. <laughs> uh, it's actually only 10. Yeah, dogs are really basic. I think that is such bullshit, Blake. That, that it just... It's just completely made up. There's there's woof, there's woof, there's woof. They can, they can go They can do all thing harumph. They can go sorry, but all cats do is go meow. I don't know. I've had Einstein for like 14 years, and he was locked in the closet today by accident, and he made the strangest sound I'd never heard before. I will leave it with sound 94. 101, actually. Could you do it for us now? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow. We have reached number four. Number four. Number four is often reserved, as it is this week, for a rest in peace. Nikki Fink, who for many years, not so long ago, was the most feared writer in Hollywood, passed away this past weekend at uh, the tender age of, I think, 68, not that yeah. old. Um, it's funny, not this is about me, but I started working at World of Wonder in 2006, the same year Nikki Fink founded Deadline, what is now Deadline.com. Um, and it was the you know 24-7 internet version of her long-running article in the LA Weekly 
She'd been a journalist for many years in many different disciplines, many different areas. Um, and it's hard to believe now because the world shifted like that. But she not only was sort of this tenacious reporter, um, she did not kowtow to studios. She had, you know, no, like, you know, the trade to that point all needed these multi, multi-page ads every day from the studios. So they had to like be very careful what they said. She was a truth teller. And I think the most important thing to me was she had a mesmerizing writing style. She was really gruff, really honest. She it was, was a, a grump, wasn't she? She was a grumpy, grumpy woman. Well, they say it takes one to no one, James. But, um, <laughs> but and, and one of my favorite, like, little sort of uh, departments or whatever she created or, or buzz phrases was told ya. Because mostly, you know, trades of that point were servicing press reports and kind of kindly and and, you know, sharing the news, she was using her sort of reporter talents and skills to go beneath, to make phone calls, to bust stories. And she really became prominent in 2007, 2008 during the writer's strike. And she was breaking news. And again, it's hard not, now we of course do this with everything, but before you get your trades in the morning, you read them with your coffee, you'd put them aside and you wait the next day. She was breaking news sometimes on the hour, on the 10 minutes and the 15 minutes. And she was not just breaking it. She was creating it and busting it wide open. Um, and people were scared of her. She yes. She was a feared writer in Hollywood. Hollywood was like very nervous about her. And key to it was, right, that she was agoraphobic. So she never went out and no one knew what she really looked like. I think there are two photographs of her that exist. And I think she lived in the Shoreham Tower, or whatever that big tower is where, she, where Cher supposedly lives at the end of, of Beverly Hills and West Hollywood right there on Sunset. The oh, the Sierra Street. Towers, right? Yes, I think I think so. But she, she she was a bit of a recluse and she did everything from home. She would harass people with phone calls. Now, she changed Hollywood forever. The great irony is she was purchased, Deadline was, she bought Deadline.com for like $17, the, the domain name, God bless her. Um, and it was purchased by Penske Media in 2009 and had a love-hate relationship with them. Penske, great, now owns Deadline.com, Variety, and Hollywood Reporter. So again, look at the crazy, you know, conglomeration ever of uh, media. And she finally left. She was kind of had a love hate relationship with the Penske guy. You know, she wasn't an employee; she was a leader. She left Deadline in 2013. Um, her last article ever published was in Deadline to, in 2016, just commemorating its 10th anniversary. And uh, again, like I said, it, in, she was living in Florida. She was uh, had a prolonged illness, is what's being reported. And she passed away, but it's it's so recent for me. It feels like yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I remember Randy talking about her. She was like, you know, it was just it was sexy, it was fun, it was dangerous. It reminds me of Perez Hilton in the beginning in a different mm -hmm. way. But how we just no, but we we were all like, what's Perez? You know, you would click on several times a day to know what was going on before there were social feeds. You were like, there were certain pioneers, if you will, who kind mm -hmm. of showed us and for better and worse, what the internet could uh, offer and, and how disruptive it was to uh, normal media. So Nikki Fink was a pioneer and uh, gone too soon. Rest in perfection or whatever it was. Uh, number three. Number three. Um, number three. Uh, I've been watching Saturday Night Live. The new season has begun season 48. Woo. And this is a bit of a rebuilding season because this year they have lost. I'm going to read you the list. 80 Bryant, Pete Davidson, Kate McKinnon, Kyle Mooney, Alex Moffat, Melissa Villasenor, Aristotle Otari, and Chris Red have all left the show. And C Cecily Strong is not with them right now either because she's here in L.A. doing the one-woman show, Search for uh, Intelligent Life in the Universe, the old... Um, Whoopi Goldberg and Lily Tomlin, Tomlin, Jane Wagner. Lily Tomlin did it, and then Whoopi did it years later on Broadway. Um, uh, so there's, um, we still have Ego Nordum, Bowen Yang, Keenan, uh, Chloe Feynman, um, Punky Johnson, Colin Jost, uh, Chris Che, um, uh, Michael Che. Um, but we also have this year, we have three new people who are sort of interesting to me. Um, oh, Andrew Dismukes has sort of moved up from. Uh, Feature player. The, yeah. And Andrew Dismukes is the twink who is so cute and a little weird, very funny, um, but very adorable. Um, we have two cute boys. One is, um, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> the cute boys. Will James be watching? There's two cute boys. I think he'll say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Michael um, uh, 
Butterfield, Michael Let it Letterfield, Michael something or other, and Marcello Hernandez. And they're both tall, lanky boys, cute twenty something boys with moppet hair. And they're very you I can't tell them apart yet because they're both adorable and they both have dark hair, a little sort of wet hair in their bangs. Um, there's another guy named Devin Walker who's really hot. He's a hot African American boy who is so funny and so good. And then there's a non-binary um uh, uh um person on the show molly kearney who is very 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 funny molly is and fucking funny molly is hysterical and there was this <laughs> thing this episode where i don't know if you saw it, where they were introducing the new cast members and molly was on and they were talking about how lauren michael the first thing he said to her was said to them was that um he wanted them to kill vladimir putin well everybody else said innocuous like you know it's really fun being here i met with i met with lauren he said you know <laughs> ease your way into it she goes and he handed me a gun he goes i want you to kill putin and they just kept cutting around and she had this they all had innocuous stories and hers was this incredible so they put me on yeah, a plane thrown into the back of the van and taken to <laughs> south america and then we'll put on to kill and it just gets built it keeps building and building and they are absolutely hysterical it's so funny um, there was also a bit of a controversy this last episode where they were doing a thing on the Try Guys uh, with, you know, the scandal with the Try Guys. And people really, really got on, on them about it and said that it was in poor taste and it was they were but they didn't quite get the joke. The joke is that nobody knows who the fuck the Try Guys are. And they're all yeah. these TikTok stars and YouTube stars that make billions of dollars and are world famous. But nobody knows who the hell they are. like not. It's they aren't really famous. And so that was the joke. But they said that it was joking about having affairs and things, having an affair, having oh, they, they were joking it was about so the clear. it was stuff. funny. It was funny that way. Can you cut back to me? Can you cut back to me? No, cut back to us. That was they had a fight at the with the CNN sketch that they were doing. So wait, did you you watched it, Tom? Because you never I, I watch bits and clips on online. Oh, I love okay. this new cast. Oh, did you hear that? My cats are 102, 102, everybody. 102. Um, and they love each other. Um, the um, the uh, I love the cast. I feel like they're really talented. I don't know who yeah. they are yet, so I need to start watching to get to know who they are. But they all they all feel like real types and real characters. And, and sometimes people come on and they feel a little generic. I'm really digging. And Molly's the most, the quickly, quickest to remember, but they all, uh, uh, I also, feel like it's Ego Nwodom, who is uh, absolutely hysterical, so good. And she seems to be, be getting more and more to do. And she, 100%. every, every and, season, she's sort of becoming And more Bowen, fabulous. I think, is becoming the, a senior member, and it's really a pleasure to yeah, see. Yeah, she, she, she's it. really a breakout star. So and I, Bowen, I, and I, Bowen. It, yeah. All right, that's SNL. Uh, what season? 48, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are more seasons of SNL than there are presidents. <laughs> yeah. Interesting fact. Um, number two. Number two. Just going to be very brief. There's a new documentary out on BBC about Virgil Abloh, the oh, yeah. creative director of Louis Vuitton, who passed away very suddenly, very young too. Um, it's called How to Be Both. And it's really good because, to be honest, I never really got Virgil Abloh. I saw this exhibition earlier in the, in the summer in New York that didn't really blow me away. Um, and I suppose one of the things that Penny dropped was like, oh my God, he did this uh, he did this design collection for Ikea. Did you know? Did you know? Did a collection for Ikea? Which included a rug, a floor rug, that was a giant printed Ikea receipt. Oh, that's that was fun. So, that was so clever. Yeah. And I also hadn't realized that he he um, he got to start working for Kanye, worked his way up through the ranks before launching Perspex 23, which was his first line of clothing, which was actually made just printing on two pre-existing clothes made by other designers. Just kind of like conceptually clever. And then, of course, he launched Off-White. One of the other things that came out was how how beloved he was as a person and how he was just so according to this documentary anyway, just so generous with his time and would talk to anyone and collaborate with multiple people and was just very much not what you might expect of a fashion designer, you know, very open, very collaborative. And I, I suppose it's just got me thinking more about this sort of Kanye's gap line, the Balenciaga line, Ugh. and Virgil Abloh. No, but they were all sort of operating in the same space, I think, of taking everything we associate with luxury and fashion and completely inverting it. 
you know, the, the recent Balenciaga show in the field of mud, you know, or selling the high price sneakers that are completely destroyed or. But we've been doing this for 40 years now. Don't act like this is something brand new. Deconstruction was huge in the 90s. I'm not with saying the, it's brand the, new, James. I five. <laughs> It's just a new intensity, I think. No, because no, no. It's a bunch of emperor's new clothes is what it is. It's silliness and it's, it's just fashion it's, ever it's, it's, any it's different. Insulting to to people who ha, you know have ratty shoes. The, the, that you that you're selling them for thirty five hundred dollars. It's 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 vulgar. It's beyond vulgar. It's just hideous. I do remember back in the day, my friends getting in trouble for cutting up their new jeans. You know, putting holes in them. I uh, I just I just I I don't I, think... I don't find it new. I don't find it interesting. <laughs> I don't find it fabulous. I think Balenciaga and Kanye are just beyond vulgar and disgusting. I sort of, Virgil, I, I put on a separate plane. I think what Virgil was doing was intelligent and creative and um, uh, a whole separate, I, I will not lump them together with fucking Balenciaga crap. Well, I think I've been um, shown the door. Uh, well, it, it, should right. we talk about Maggie Haberman again? Should we bring up Maggie Haberman Fenton? Hey, the first season of Drag Race Philippines is now available on in full on Wow Presents Plus. Um, sign up at wowpresentsplus.com. And when we come back, because we're going to take one more break, we'll reveal the number one thing this week that made us go wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. It's Fenton here with James and Tom. We've been counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow, which means that we've finally come to the number one spot, the big reveal. Number one. That's me. I'm going to talk about this because uh, this past week, the Republicans, the conservatives, the right wingers are up in arms over uh, the news that Velma on Scooby-Doo is coming out as a lesbian. There have been all sorts of clips of her and she sees a pretty girl and her eyes go ah, and she does. She goes bananas over this girl and she finally revealed that after 45 years, 50 years, Velma, as we've all suspected, is a lesbian like Peppermint Patty before her. And um, uh, it's on a new Netflix show that is a new HBO Max show that's coming out Um uh, a Scooby-Doo Halloween thing. And then also in, in February, I believe there's a series called Velma that's happening with Mindy Kaling, Kaling doing the voice. And sh she will definitely be a carpet munching dyke. Okay, I want to be solving a, carpet munching. I think this is awesome. I think we all knew this in our little gay hearts watching Scooby-Doo. Yes. James, I want to know, 45 years it's taking Velma to come out. How do you feel about that? Do you feel like she's... Uh... She's 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 let us down as LGBT. Well, I you know I sort of always suspected that it, that it would be Fred, that Fred with his <laughs> little you know orange cravat. You were, always you were hoping the first one was going to come out, and then I saw on Fox and Friends they were making fun of this, and they were saying, "What's next? Bestiality with Shaggy and Scooby?" And they were oh, sort I of hate trying that. to turn it into. Um, a whole so show. Mindy Mindy is going to be the the voice of Velma, yeah. And is should it be a lesbian person doing the voice? Well, does, I mean, you. I don't think we need to. Do we need a lesbian to voice lesbians? Is this what you're trying to yes, get? Yes, we at? do, James. How dare you? I, I don't. I don't know anymore because that. That's again. That's a whole other. What's cultural appropriation and what's acting and what's bar? What's what's culture? Right, exactly. You know, I mean, do, can, yes. Well, that is a whole other bo box of worms that we need to open sometime, but not today. Not today. I, Let's just yeah. celebrate her lesbianness. Yes. Blake, you look poised to say something profound. No, I just love that you said, how dare you, James? I love when you say that. <laughs> how dare you, James? <laughs> well, mercifully, that's all we got time for this week. <laughs> same time, same place next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, James. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Einstein, 101 years old. Survived, locked in the closet. <laughs> Yeah. I still. Uh, how many lock? How many closet stories have we had this week? <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Same time, same place. Next week, until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. Meow. Meow. Meow.